Morning, everyone. It's good to see everyone here. It's good to see it's not raining for the first time in a couple of days. We'll see how long that holds out. <clears throat> but let's uh, begin our worship service with hymn number 38. So if you would stand with me, we're going to sing Grace Greater Than Our Sin, hymn number 38. Please remain standing as we have uh, Jack come forward with our scripture reading. Good morning. Isn't it great to be here this morning? I'm going to be reading from John chapter 15, verses 8 through 18. John chapter 15, verses 8 through 18, it says, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments... You shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, 
that you love one another as I, as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servant, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I call you friend, for all the things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that you should go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain, that who, whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, it may be given to you. These things have I commanded you, that you love one another. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Fathers, we come in your presence this morning. We just thank and praise you for the freedom that we have to come here and to worship you. So Lord, as we pause in your presence and we've heard your word, we've worshiped you in song, and we'll worship you in uh, the teaching of your word. Father, we pray that as we pause, just basking in your presence, Lord, knowing that uh, as scripture says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, you're there in the midst. So Father, we know that you're here right now this morning. We pray that we could just put the busyness of the earth far from us, so that we could forget about the things that we have to accomplish throughout the rest of this day, or, or the busy week that's coming up. Or maybe, Lord, that there's a physical health difficulty or something weighing heavy on our minds. Lord, we just pray that um, you would just allow us to be calm in your presence, that we could take a deep breath and just focus on who you are. So, Father, we just pray that this worship would be a sweet, smelling savor in your sight. In your name we pray. Amen. All righty, let's open to hymn number 223. And as we sing, just remember, uh, it's a chaotic world out there. Um, but what we, we need, need to keep in the back of our head, or actually at the forefront of our head, is that it is well. God's got it under, under control. God's got this. Hymn number 223, It Is Well With My Soul, and then as we sing, the, the kids are going to head out to junior church.
may be seated. And now we'd like to have Jack come forward with the sermon. Good morning. All I can say is, we're home. <laughs> Did you guys have a busy week? Did you feel abused? Do you feel tired? Do you feel dragged out? Couldn't think of a better place to be right now than in church. Not because it's religion, not because it's wisdom, but because it's life. Because I know Jesus Christ is my personal Savior, I have a relationship with him. And so I can stand here right now in front of all of you and just go, because I can relax. Oh, yeah, you're all looking at me. I understand that. But that's okay. Because everything that I say this morning, I'm going to say from God's word. And so if you're going to throw tomatoes at me, uh, make sure they're not rotten and I'll eat them. But uh, last week, we started out with talking about love. And we looked at several passages of scripture that said that Jesus was compelled or moved by compassion. I don't know. We looked at probably eight or ten passages of scripture. And as he ministered to the crowds, he ministered to their physical needs, their personal needs, their emotional needs, some of a combination of all of those. He met their needs of loneliness. He met their needs of food. He also met their spiritual needs. And so um, we had talked about last week, the title was Love with a Purpose and with Direction. So last week, we looked at Jesus' example outside, if you will, to the world. And as a church, Scripture tells us that we're to be witnesses. It says in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the world. In other words, we're not supposed to be locked in these four walls. I, now, I was in the church, you know, after everybody left, there was nobody here. So I understand that you all went into the world. When ask a question, don't answer me, just think about it. Did you have the opportunity to demonstrate Christ's love to the world this week? And you think, well, you know what? Uh, well, Scripture says if you give a cup of cold water in my name, he did it for me. So if you did anything to the world, you were demonstrating Christ's love. It's interesting because as we talked about Jesus Christ, who's our ultimate example, um, he helped me needs. Um, but outside these four walls, did you help? And I'm going to be kind of locked my notes today. So don't mind me if I'm not looking at you. But did you help meet somebody's needs this week? Um, did you look outside the four walls because you knew the person? Did you look outside these four walls to demonstrate love? Because I'm going to use the word I just said. You love them. Um, did you do it because God commanded you to do it? Did you do it because you were being noticed? Did you do it because you're moved by compassion, moved by love? Did you do it because you saw their need for eternal, for, you saw their need of eternal separation from God in hell forever? I know that's not popular today because we live in a, day, a society today where when we do something wrong, it's okay. If you live in New York State, there's no bail. I can commit murder. They'll charge me with my crimes. They'll let me out. On my own goodwill and character, I'll come back to my, tr my trial. But that's the society we live in. When you go to a sports tournament, everybody gets a trophy. There's a lot of them. They don't even keep score anymore. I can't figure that one out. But as you looked at people this week, and I'm going to ruin us, as you walked by the person at Walmart, did you think that person doesn't know Christ as their personal Savior? Consequences. If they died right now, because of their sin, they're going to hell. Scripture says, for all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. It goes on to say, for the price of sin is death. And if I stop right there, we might as well just all go out in our cars, hit the gas pedal, and don't even try to make the corner out there and just 
die. But there's an interesting thing. It says, God commended his love towards us, comma, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I have hope. Yes, I sin. Yes, I do bad things. But I'm forgiven. And so as we looked at last week about Jesus being moved by compassion, as you walk through the world this week, were you moved by compassion? I'm a very impatient person. I hate traffic. I can't tell you how many times this week I sat in traffic. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, move. I'm just going to run them off the road. Is that compassion? Is that love? And you know, you got this car who didn't plan ahead in, in the lane beside me. Am I going to let them in or I'm just going to make them sit there? Am I going to have compassion? I'm probably going to let them sit there. Maybe it's somebody behind me. No. Am, am I moved by compassion? That's a funny thing, but it's true. Compassion would say, Jack, yield your will. You're right, but yield your will and let them go. As a child of God, as I interacted with the unsaved this week, there's many. Many, many, many more than children of God. As I interacted with them, did I have compassion? When they made fun of me, I'm a good subject for that. When they made fun of me, did I understand why they're acting the way they are? I'm going to read a lot of verses this week. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to look at verses 19 through 25. Hebrews chapter 10. And the question would be, why do we serve outside the church, outside these four walls? Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25 say, and I'll just pause a moment, I hear pages turning. Starting in verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest of, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with the true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another in so much that the more as ye see the day approaching. So what is my purpose this morning in sharing God's word? It says in verse 24, let us consider one another, children of God, to provoke unto love and good works. So what is my purpose this morning? Usually when you hear the word provoke, it's a bad thing. You know, growing up as a kid, I, my dad, you know, he was a disciplinarian, would smack me in the back of the head and say, stop provoking your sister. You know, I was sitting, you know, you know how that goes. Or, or when dad had turned his head, I'd pull her long hair. I don't know what happened but I'd provoke her. And then she'd get angry and haul off and hit me. Dad, she hit me. His response was, yeah, you had it coming. <laughs> Double jeopardy. And, and she learned that, and she'd haul off and belt me hard because knowing there were no consequences. But my purpose this morning, the Holy, purpose, the Holy Spirit's purpose this morning is to provoke us, to poke us, to, if you will, if the shoe fits, irritate us, anger us, to do something about it. But it says, let us consider one another to provoke unto good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much as the more, as you see the day approaching. It's saying, this is a good thing, us all sitting here right now. This is a good thing, because we're assembling together. But we're to provoke each other, stir each other up, encourage each other. Maybe confront me if I'm not doing what I should be doing. Maybe confront me if I'm doing something that is contrary to God's word. But it says provoking unto love and good works. Think about your family dynamics of this morning. You always have a peacemaker. You always have one that is quiet and never says anything. You always have one that's quick to say I'm sorry. You got one that's quick to fight. Think about all those dynamics. All those, we'll call them negative traits. But then we always have the one that's quick to say, I love you. Forgive me. You have another one that says, why don't we do this when there's controversy? And all of those things. We have one that has maturity. 
We have one that's always provoking. We have another that's following the rules, saying, oh, we should be doing this, this, and this. You know something? We have all of them here in this room as children of God. I love it. Because how many of you tend to be bold? When you see somebody doing something wrong, do you say something? Mm, yeah, Some, some, right? How many of you, when you see somebody doing something wrong, do you say, I don't want to be a witness? How many of you, when you see somebody doing something good, do you pause and encourage them? You see, we have all of those in this room. Verse 24 says, So as believers, so as children of God, as family members today, we can see in verse 24, let us stir up one another. Let's provoke each other to love and good works. Hmm. In other words, another passage of scripture that comes to mind is iron sharpens iron. So the friend, a countenance of a friend. In other words, we're here together for the purpose of encouraging each other, provoking each other to do what's right, to help each other, to support each other as we live life as a child of God, as a family, if you will. Turn with me to John chapter 15. We're going to look at verses 1 through 9. John chapter 15, verses 1 through, five, 1 through 9. John 15, verses 1 through 9, starting in 1. It says, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men, and men gather them up and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask whatever you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples, as the Father hath loved me, so I have loved you. Continue in my love. Interesting passage of scripture. How many of you garden? I have a fine patch of weeds. Just, just saying. It's a fine patch. If you part the weeds, you're going to see tomatoes. You'll see peppers. Not yet, but there's eggplants there. No fruit on it yet. Um, cabbage. You part the weeds a little more, you might find some other things. But I'm finding that in amongst the weeds, critters hide also. I, I'm looking at pepper plants that have very few leaves on them. Woodchucks, rabbits, deer. They're hiding amongst everything. I, I look at my garden and off to the right, I have a couple peach trees. They need pruned. I, I look off to the other side, I have grapevines. They need pruned back to nothing. If you think you've killed them, you probably pruned them enough. Why do we prune things? Well, if you look at my peach tree, there's branches all over the place. And a couple years ago, I pruned the tree like I would an apple tree. But the branches that, like an apple tree, bear fruit, don't bear fruit on a peach tree. So what I did is I went through and I pruned all the branches that bear fruit. You know those long whip branches on an apple tree that you want to get rid of? I'm here to tell you, if you do that on a peach tree, you get no peaches. So, the purpose of pruning is to get more fruit. I'm kind of greedy. In that, pe that peach tree, I don't want five peaches. I don't want ten peaches. I want a couple dozen peaches, you know, like this. And so I have to put the time into it, and I have to prune it. Tomatoes. We need to pick off all those little branches that do nothing. There's a reason for that. This passage of Scripture says, and uh, it speaks about Jesus being the vine. Now, this worked very well into the Jewish culture because he's talking about a grape. And Jesus says, I am the vine. My father is the husbandman. What's a husbandman? That means nothing to us. A husbandman is one who cultivates and uh, takes care of the property or the plants. That's their main job. So Jesus is saying, I'm the vine. 
God is the husband and the one who takes care of everything. And he says that every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, I prune it. Do you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior? You're a branch. As a child of God, he's going to prune you. I promise. I didn't say it. He says it right here. He's going to prune you. What's the purpose? To hurt you? No. To cause you to bear fruit. And as we read down through this passage of Scripture, not only is Jesus greedy, he doesn't want a little fruit. It says he wants much fruit. But he says that every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he prunes it so that it bears fruit. So, Jack has a problem with lying. So somebody's going to confront Jack when he lies. Scripture says, be sure your sins will find you out. I got a problem with the temper. Somebody's going to see it. Somebody's going to hear it. It's going to be pruned. Name your sin. Name what hinders you from bearing fruit. If you're a child of God, you will be pruned. The whole purpose of the pruning is so that you bear not just a little fruit, but much fruit. I try to glance around the room. Look at all the empty chairs. Just let your eyes, go ahead, it's okay, you can look. You can turn around and look. There's a lot of empty chairs. In fact, there's probably half as many empty chairs as there are full chairs. Do you want to see this building filled? Bear fruit. Bear fruit. Do you want to see this building filled? Careful when I say this. Careful before you do it. God, prune me. God, as, as uh, I believe it was uh, David said, if there be any wicked, evil way in me, show me. Be careful, because he's going to do it. Be careful if you say, God, prune me. He's going to do it. What is the purpose of the church? The purpose of the church. Is it to see lots of unsaved people here? Is it to bring the world in here to share the gospel? We can do that. But the purpose of the church is to equip, to equip the believer to go out. To go out. To bear fruit. To demonstrate, to use, to harness what you've learned here. Verse 5 says um, that Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. And he says that unless you're part of the, the bush, the vine, you're not going to bear fruit. It says in verse 7 and 8, your father is glorified that you bear much fruit. What's the purpose of bearing fruit? Is it to pat us on the back? Or is it to glorify God? What's your motivation? Is your motivation of going out to have people say, oh, such a wonderful person? Or is your purpose of going out is so the world can watch you and desire to have what you have? John chapter 15. We're going to look at a couple verses, verses 10 and 11. John 15, verses 10 and 11. And uh, he finishes that passage of Scripture, and he tells us basically to follow his example. But John chapter 15, verses 10 and 11 say, If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments. Abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, that your joy might be full. Do you want a happy life? Do you want a happy life? Do you want to be joyful? I'm going to pause. Think about some of the early disciples and how they died. Think of how they lived, sharing the gospel, what Jesus Christ did daily. Think about Paul. Do you think he enjoyed sitting in prison, chained? But he was joyful. When I say this, your life might not all be roses. But he says here, um, these things that I've spoken unto you, that your joy might remain in you, that your joy might be full. Do you want to demonstrate the joy of Jesus Christ? 
be in his word. Do you want to demonstrate the joy of Jesus Christ? Do you want to be happy? Do you want to be joyful? Grow. Bear fruit. Be in his word. Again, the purpose this morning is to provoke, to stir up. Did you ever have them family meetings at home? Sam, did we ever have family meetings? Yeah, they're necessary. As a church, how are we going to impact the community? I didn't say, how is the church going to impact the community? I said, how are we going to impact the community? Are you demonstrating Christ's love? Are you demonstrating the fact, as we talked about last week, that he was moved by compassion, that he went out? John 15, verses 12 through 14 say, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Do you know who he's talking about loving? That who I'm supposed to love? He's talking about me loving you and you loving me, the church. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. You are my friends if you do whatever I commanded you. John chapter 3, verse 16 says what? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus says, not only am I his child, but I'm his friend. And it goes on to say, no greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for a friend. We tend to be very selfish. Hey, dads, look at me for a second. Grandpas, would you lay down your life if your grandchild was in trouble? If your grandchild was along the edge of the road walking, would you dive out if there was a car coming at him to save them? Hey, dad, if your child was in peril of dying, would you risk your life to save them? It's interesting because we'll do that for family, our immediate family. Would you do that for a stranger? Would you risk your life for somebody you don't know? Jesus says, you're my friend if you do whatsoever I command you. He was commanding me that there's no greater love than this. What he's telling us is he's commanding us to love each other just like I love my children. How many of your siblings? Do you love your brothers and sisters? <clears throat> Did you have sibling rivalry when you grew up? Were you always trying to outdo your sibling? Did you have a sibling you always fought with? Did you have a sibling that you always got along best with? Did you have a sibling that you always wanted to get in trouble? Did you have a sibling that you used to say, that's goody two shoes, they always do so well. Did you have a sibling you always wanted to see get in trouble? Did you try to make them look bad or maybe make mom and dad feel differently about you? I had one of those siblings. I had one I got along great with. I had one that I always got to, wanted to get in trouble. And I had another who, yes, yeah, she was always getting me in trouble. But I'll share an instance with you. Friday nights, typical teen, we'd go out Friday night. And uh, my dad would say, be in at 11. And my mom would stand there at the door just like this. You're one minute late. My mom's German. You're one minute late. You don't go out next week. So next week, when I could finally go out, two weeks from then, I just drove faster. And, and I made it on time because I didn't want to miss a week. And I had a sister who could come in like an hour late and nothing would be said because we, we got to take care of her. And so I was always trying to get her in trouble. And uh, there was a certain Friday night I knew she was going to be late. We had one of them old farmhouses with wooden steps and all that. At the bottom of the steps was a door come up around the corner, you take a couple steps, there's another door. So I took soda cans, I put little stones in them, and I lined them up on the step. 
I hear her car coasting down the hill, no lights. She pulls into the driveway. I hear just a little squeak of the brakes. Yes. I hear the kitchen door go. As she walks in, I hear the latch clip. I'm right above her. I hear it going across the kitchen floor. I hear her going to the living room. I hear the doorknob turn. She pushes open the door and all these cans. <laughs> there was a long pause. I didn't hear a creak on the steps. I heard the door close. Squeak, squeak, squeak. As she went up the steps, she opened the other door. Crash, boom, bang. <laughs> yes. I hear my dad, Jill, we'll talk about this in the morning. Yes. I purposely tried to get her in trouble, and it worked. Sibling rivalry. We're family. How do we interact with each other? Is there one of those you get along better with? One of those you always want to point out what's going wrong? One of those that doesn't matter what they do, they're perfect. You see, as we sit here as children of God, as family, how do we interact? As we interact, I promise you, the world is watching. I'm going to put myself in the parent position now. At the time, I was just a teenager. I never thought about mom and dad. Now that I'm a parent and I have kids, I realize how that made my parents feel when Jill and I were always fighting. When my sister was always saying I was breathing her air, pulling her hair. Or, or my brother, who I always got along with, we excluded everybody else because, you know, he's my little brother. I'm going to take care of him. Now I realize how my parents felt. My dad used to say, when we'd uh, fight it out and one of us would come to him and say, so-and-so hit me, he used to say, I'm not a traffic cop, you dealt with it. Now I know how God feels. As a family... As we work through things, how do we interact with each other? I'm asking this question because the world is watching. O outside these four walls, the world is listening. There's a couple reasons why. Scripture said, as we read this morning, Jesus said, the world hates me. They hate you too. They're listening. Because I want to know if what we say we are is different than who they say they are. I had said earlier about John chapter 3, verse 16. I became a part of this family, not because of what I did, but what Jesus Christ did for me. You see, he died on the cross for my sins. Remember, b before I was yet his child, he died for me. While I was yet a sinner. While I was still doing things wrong. While I still hated him and was his enemy. He died for me. That passage of scripture says there's no greater love than this, than a man lay down his life for a friend. And ask a question. As a family, are we really persecuted? Not really. There's a day coming. Are we willing, as a family, to make sacrifices for each other? I'll go right to the ultimate. Are we willing to die for each other? Are we willing, let's start simple now, to help out with a meal when there's a need? Are we willing to watch somebody's children when there's something going on? Are we willing to help out around somebody's house? Are we willing to help somebody with the struggle that they're having spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally? Are we willing help out with a financial need? Are we willing, as a family, to make sacrifices for each other? You see, we watch Jesus reaching out. I think that's the easy part, reaching out. Because my dad used to say to me all the time, and it's so true, you hurt those you love the most. That's the truth. Jesus said, I'm commanding you he didn't say, I'm suggesting. He's not saying, would you please? He's not saying, could you just? He's saying, love 
one another. It's a command. It's a command. Our purpose this morning is to provoke and to stir up. Our purpose here this morning is family, is to cause family to grow. John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35 say, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know you are my disciples, if you love one another. Well, let me put it to you in today's terms. If you guys love each other as a family, the world will know that we're all a part of the family. By how we treat each other, as a family, the world will know that we're his children. That's interesting because if you put the whole Clark family together, my family, my brother's family, my sister's family, my sister's families, my dad's brothers and sisters, my mom's sisters, if you put us all together, you'd start seeing similar characteristics. Very similar characteristics. You take my, my dad's brothers and sister and put them in a room with a hundred other people, you'd be able to pick out the Clarks. You take my immediate family, put us in a room with a hundred people, odds are you're going to pick out the Clarks. Same with your family. If you took us as a family and put us in Honesdale, would the world be able to tell by how we treat, how we interact, how we demonstrate love, that we're a family. Hmm. You see, as we read God's word, we need to make it personal. Basically, what that passage of scripture is saying, that the world would know you're his disciple. He's saying, if you love one another, here's the proof. Here's the evidence. Here's the demonstration. Here's what unconditional love looks like. You see, Jesus Christ died for me even though I was a bad person thousands of years before I was born. That's unconditional. He said, I don't care what you look like. I don't care what you act like. I don't care what you smell like. I don't even care whose family you're a part of. I love you. I'm dying for you. That's unconditional love. And so when he says in that passage of Scripture, by this shall all men know you're my disciples if you love one another. If we love one another, we're demonstrating what he's done for us. You know, we talk about, and I always like the negatives, as you can tell. Do you want to know what a child of God looks like? Do you want to know what this family should look like? Let's look at a couple passages of scripture, and I'm going to show you what the world looks like. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 43 through 46. Matthew chapter 5. And it says, starting in verse 43, You have heard that which hath been said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemy, bless them that curse you, do good unto them that hate you, pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of the Father which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love them which, I, if you love, them which love you, what reward do you have? Even the sinners do the same. So, we're just going to kind of take the opposite of what this says. He's telling us to love our neighbors because obviously the world doesn't. He's telling us to love our enemies because our enemies hate us. He's telling to bless those that curse you. In other words, do the opposite. You know the, the golden rule? Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. When somebody's mean to you, do the opposite. When I get cut off by that person right there, okay, I got cut off by that person right there. When, when somebody says something bad about me, okay, somebody says something bad about me. We do the opposite. I mean, those are some pretty severe things. Love your, it says here, you shall love your neighbor. So obviously, if I love my neighbor, that's a demonstration of Christ's love. If I love somebody that hates me, isn't that a demonstration also? Another passage of Scripture. Um, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verses 
Turn with me to Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 33. And again, it's a parallel passage of Scripture. Luke 27, or Luke 6, 27 through 33. And it says in verse 27, But I say unto you which hear, Love your enemies and do good unto them that hate you. Bless them that curse you and pray for them that use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on one cheek, offer the other also. And him that taketh away your coat, forbid him not to take just your coat. Give every man that asketh of thee of him that taketh away from you good, and ask them not again. And as you would that men should set, do unto you, do also to them likewise. For if you love them which love you, what thanks have you? For sinners also love those that love them. And if you do good unto them which do good unto you, what thanks have you? For sinners also do the same. So if somebody punches me in the face, I'm supposed to let it go. If somebody steals my coat, I'm supposed to say, here's my shirt. If somebody hates me, I'm to love them. If somebody despises me and uses me, I'm to treat them nice. So you see, we're seeing what the world does. And he's showing us, as believers, how we should act. In this passage of scripture, I see several things. Number one, I see unconditional love. If somebody punches me in the face, I'm not going to be happy. But I'm to love them regardless. I see a forgiving love. I see a forgiving love. If somebody steals my coat, I'm supposed to say, here's my shirt. I see a giving love. The golden rule, do unto others as you have them do unto you. A giving love. First John chapter, uh, let's see here, let me look at the time. First John chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. First John chapter 2, verses 10 and 11 say, He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is no occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walks in darkness, and, don't know, and knows not where he goes, because darkness has blinded his eyes. So as children of God, as family, we're to love one another because the world by nature hates. And we're going to close in, first John, or in John chapter 15, verses 16 through 19. John chapter 15, verses 16 through 19 say, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and have ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit, and your fruit should remain. Whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. These things I have commanded that you love one another. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world will love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates me. I read that passage of scripture and it really catches my attention. As children of God, why do we need to demonstrate his love? Why do we need to love one another regardless? Because the outstanding evidences of the world is the hate. You see, if the world's characteristics are the hate, then the opposite of that is the children of God, love. think about that for a moment, it causes me to pause. That scripture says that the world, Jesus said, the world hates me. Because you're my children, because you're my friend, they hate you also. So as we sit here this morning, remember we looked at that first passage of scripture, it was to stir each other up, to provoke us to love and do right. Jesus said, if you're my child, if you're living the way you should be living and the world knows it, they hate you. I'll say that again. They hate you. Let me say that a third time. They hate you. That's not light, is it? So when we come to church as family, as the world watches us, what characteristics do they see in us? 
Do they see a body, a family, brothers and sisters who are quick to love, who are quick to forgive, who are quick to work together, who are quick to help with others' needs? I love, you guys get the prayer chain? I love that. I don't have my phone with me, but you open it up and it says, pray for so-and-so because here's their struggle. Do you do that? I love that. I just absolutely love that. As the world watches us as a family, what do they see? Do they see a loving family that gets along seamlessly, smoothly, that desires to turn the world upside down? I can't get over that. The world, and I'm going to say it, the world hates me. Not because I'm stupid, not because I'm offensive, not because I go out of my way to hurt people. They hate me because I'm a child of God. He started out this morning by saying we need to bear fruit. So when the world hates me, when the world does evil things against me, when they say bad things, when they're out to get me, I need to bear fruit. Why? I'm not representing Jack Clark. I'm not representing the Clark family. I'm representing the family of God. Remember Jesus when they had their, we'll call it the Last Supper, the Passover meal, and he went out into the garden and prayed, and the soldiers came and grabbed him. They took him to the trial. They beat him. They mocked him. They took his clothes. It says he was so beaten they couldn't even tell he was a man. What did he do? Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. You see, I'm representing the family of God in everything that I say and do. If the world hates me, I'm in great company because they hated Jesus also. I need to pray because if you hit me, I'm going to hit you back. I need to pray. I need to demonstrate the love that Jesus Christ exhibited. When they beat him, did he fight back? Yeah. He said he was like a lamb, dumb, led before the shearers. We need to love each other because we have a common goal. That's to demonstrate Christ's love. Because the world hates us and abuses us, we need to encourage each other. I'm going to say that again. Instead of pointing out everybody's faults, that's for me is very easy. We need to encourage each other. Why? The world hates me. The world hates you. And finally, when we're abused and used and thrown out, we need to remember we're not a part of this world. As scripture tells us, we're ambassadors, pilgrims, just going through. Do you ever meet somebody briefly for a day or two? They made a huge impact in your life and they were gone. As children of God, that's what we're to be. Somebody passing through and made a huge impact by what we do or say, or didn't do, or didn't say. So as we looked last week at Jesus being moved by compassion, Crosspoint Bible Church, let me put it to you this way, Crosspoint Bible Church, family. Are we loving with purpose and direction? Are we pointedly reaching into the world. Are we loving with purpose? By this shall all men know you're my disciples, if you have love for one another, purpose. Direction. Are we reaching into lives? Within this family, are we living like Jesus Christ? Are we loving like Jesus Christ? Are we being moved and motivated and serving within these four walls? Are we being moved and motivated 
to serve each other with love and compassion and with urgency outside these four walls. Until we get it right here, we miss every time out there. Until I love you and you love me, like, tr like Jesus Christ, love those he was moved by compassion, the world isn't going to listen to us. Why? Because it's said in that verse, by this shall all men know you're my disciples. By this, the world's going to know we're his children if we have love for one another. Pause. Your brain's going like this. Do I demonstrate the love of Christ within these four walls to have the ability to go out there? By this shall all men know you're my disciples if you love one another. He commanded me to love. I said to you, if somebody punched me in the nose, I want to punch him back. As children of God, are we so busy entangled here that we don't have the strength, that we don't have the know-how, that we don't have the spiritual resources to go into the world? Ours is our testimony our example, our love proceeding us outside these four walls. As people hear about, put your name there, as people hear out there about us, Jack Clark, I'm working in a name with each face. As they hear about us outside of here, what do they think? Number one, of your testimony and example, my testimony and example, what do they think of the example and testimony of Cross Point Bible Church? We started out by saying this morning the purpose was to stir up, to provoke, to cause, to motivate each of us. So as I read these passages of Scripture and go through this whole thing, the ultimate question is, am I demonstrating Christ's love by loving my family? Hmm. Yeah. Father, as we come into your presence this morning, we thank you for the many passages of Scripture that you give us. We thank you for last week showing us how you were moved by compassion, that you met so many needs, Lord, physical, spiritual, emotional. We think of the widow who her son died. And it's all she had in the world. And uh, Jesus paused and raised him. He cared about even that widow. And yet, Lord, we think about Cross Point Bible Church. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing that you've given us of this building. Cross Point Bible Church doesn't need a building, but we thank you for that. We thank you for knowing that this gift is so that we can equip the believers, so that we can reach into the world and to share the gospel with those around us. Father, as I stand in your presence this morning, I pray that I'd search my heart, that I'd search my life, and ask myself, am I loving others? By, by my example of loving the people in my family, does the world around me know that I'm your disciple? Because of how I love my fellow believers, my family members, does the world hate me because I'm your child? So, Lord, we pray that we could get encouragement, that we could get refreshment, that we could get safety from each member of this family here this morning. Father, we pray that you'd use each one of us. As Scripture says, so iron sharpens iron, so the friend, the countenance of a friend. Father, that we remember that not only are we friends, we're your children. So, Father, use each one of us. Father, we pray that you'd stir each one of us up. Provoke us to do what's right. Provoke us to love one another. 
Provoke us to serve you. Provoke us to love unconditionally. Provoke us to look at the people outside these four walls and think, saved, knowing you as their personal Savior and on their way to heaven. Or look at them and say, doesn't know you, on their way to hell forever. And provoke us to pause, to pray for them, to share the passages of Scripture that we all know so well, of the hope that they need. Father, we thank you so much. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you, Jack. Um, for our last song, if you would stand with me, we're going to open to hymn number 299. And this is a song that everybody should know. And as you sing it, though, it's a simple song, but think about it. We were called to intentionally follow Jesus. We've decided to follow Jesus. Hymn number 299. Dear Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this time that we have to come here together to worship you, Lord. We thank you for the lesson that, that Jack has preached. And Lord, I pray that as we go out into this world, that we'll remember that you are in control and that our life as Christians is to be intentional and that we should be reaching out to others uh, and telling them the good news about you. Lord, I, I just pray that we are the best ambassadors that we can be for you. Uh, Lord, I thank you again for this church family. I pray that you will watch over us as we go out. Bring us back again safely next time. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <laughs>